Hello everyone! Haunted houses are the worst, with their ghosts and curses and portals. But sometimes this is taken to the next logical step, turning the house itself into a monster. So now we are going to study their speculative biology and see what makes them tick. Please consider haunting this channel with your likes and subs. And now, let's walk into fear. Have you ever been on the street, escaping from a monster or something, and run into a random abandoned house only for the house to try to eat you? Happens to me every time. What you've encountered is Megalostracos oikomimus, the shell house. These enormous bivalves, relatives of the common mimic, have adapted to life on dry land by developing much thicker tissues that prevent the loss of moisture as well as muscular siphons that allow them to extract oxygen from the air around them. Adults of the species are mostly sessile, with their foot derived into two large locomotor organs, allowing them a very limited degree of movement. They will, however, rarely need to move, since their hunting strategy not only favors, but requires that they stay in place. Their heavy shell, which resembles the rocky terrain, has only one small opening at the front, causing these huge mollusks to resemble a cave-like structure. Their light bioluminescent spots make their entrance more visible, and therefore more attractive during an emergency. Curious animals may see this and believe it to be a possible shelter, especially when hiding from the rain or from predators, and as soon as they enter the shell house, their fate will be sealed. Once inside, most animals will quickly find themselves stuck to the floor, actually a modified portion of the foot. Unable to escape, there is little they can do as they watch the shell house's stomach descend upon them, to digest them externally before absorbing the nutrients and retracting back into place. The only external parts of the shell house, aside from its foot, are the siphons twin structures present in many bivalves and tasked with reproduction, breathing, feeding and excretion. In this species, the two siphons have specialized into specific functions. The upper siphon is held high above the body, pointing upwards, and it is dedicated entirely to respiration, while the lower siphon is tasked with reproduction. Given their new environment and large size, Shell houses have evolved a reproductive strategy convergent with plant pollination. This siphon will burrow through the ground and emerge some distance away from the shell, constantly producing digestive residue to attract scavengers that act as pollinators, with the gamete packets of the shell house becoming stuck to the scavenger as it leaves. Should any opportunistic predator try to bite at the siphon itself, that will be the only moment when the shellhouse will leave its spot to give chase to said animal. Shellhouses, it should be noted, are hermaphroditic, like many other bivalves, and once one is fertilized it will create a small, flooded nursery for its larvae to develop. They will stay there, fed by the adult's waste, until they have developed into a pedibeliger, the stage where the foot is formed. They will leave as soon as their highly mobile foot is capable of transporting them across land, until they are capable of finding a clearing on which they will dig and begin the next stage of their life cycle. While their siphons will help them attract and feed on small invertebrates, eventually they will begin hunting larger prey, feeding and growing into their adult stage. Currently there is no known limit to their size, and some truly titanic individuals can be found across the world even holding entire ecosystems of animals such as ghost octopuses and skeleton wasps within them, which thrive by avoiding the animal's stomach. The remains of the largest individual ever known, nicknamed Saint Peter when it was alive, still stand tall in Rome, Italy. While in the past it was believed these organisms evolved to mimic human houses, the idea that they could evolve in such a drastic manner and in such a short amount of time was placed into question. Now, fossil evidence allows us to determine that these bivalves far predate human housing, or humans for that matter. 
It is now believed that some of the first human populations that shared their habitat with the shell house used the shells of deceased individuals as shelter, only eventually learning to make their own buildings by emulating the appearance of these organisms. And that's it for a speculative biology look into haunted houses. Man, by the time these episodes are over, we'll have nowhere to run, will we? This has been a common subject of discussion over on our Discord server, with ideas for it including everything from sponges to crustaceans to trees. But we finally went with mollusks for a nice balance between the sessile structure and the living, moving parts also adding to it the horror of having the shapeless insides feeding on you while you stand around helplessly. <sighs> Don't you just love Halloween? Of course, we also played with the aspect of their shells evolving from something tiny, to haunted houses, to entire haunted churches and castles, and also with making them not mimics, but inspirations for real houses, since we felt it made a lot more sense that way. As always, here's a big scary thank you to everyone who wanted to see this episode, and whose ideas helped give this episode shape. And also, thank you to our researchers and research associates for helping me bring this one home, both on concept and design. Remember, you too can join in to get to see all of our creatures and videos ahead of time, help mold them into shape, and why not support the channel in the process. Or you can also like, subscribe, or write a comment telling me any type of creature you would like me to give the speckable treatment in the show. Any of those really help the channel a lot. Thank you all for screaming, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.